The goal of any structural design is to ensure that you have the most efficient design possible. It's not something that you pick up any textbook because if you look through there, it only really covers the design elements and not how to design a concrete structure efficiently. It's something that you pick up through time or being passed down from engineer to engineer. Hey, can you tell me how to design concrete structures efficiently? Just wait a minute. Yes, I'll be covering it in the video. Okay, I'll go and listen. Keep listening. So whenever you're performing any design, where should you start to ensure you have the most efficient scheme possible? Locating your vertical supports is where you need to start in any scheme, as this will be really critical to any design. And to make an efficient design, you want to try and eliminate as many transfers as possible through the height of the building. So you do this by overlaying all the plans from top to bottom to see where you can get vertical supports and trying to continue them through the whole height to eliminate any transfers. And something that's often overlooked is the transition between the car parking floors below and the typical residential or commercial floors above as they typically have a varying grid between these locations. However, if you're able to maintain an efficient grid through the car park, through the height of the building, you eliminate some of these transfers and make a more efficient design. So what's an efficient grid layout for a car parking slab? Well, in one direction, you've got an 8.1 grid as this allows a three car parking bay with two in columns. And in the other direction, you have a varying grid of nine meters and 7.6. So you have a nine meter grid between the car parks and a 7.6 grid at the aisles. So wherever possible, trying to maintain that car parking grid through the height of the building will achieve a more efficient design in the end. An area that is often forgotten about is the benefits of cantilevers in your design. If you're able to pull the column grid slightly back from the column edge, you have a significantly more efficient design by improving deflections and also balancing out the positive and negative bending moments. So wherever possible, trying to pull back the column grid so you have roughly a one third or one sixth cantilever based on its backspan will achieve a more efficient design overall. So where possible, looking for where you can have those cantilevers for a more efficient column grid. The efficient engineering approach is to ensure that you've clicked that like button. Not only does it help my channel out, but also works out the type of content to create for you. When designing vertical supports, it's often something that's often overlooked in the efficient design of concrete structures. However, there is some simple rules that we can apply to make sure these elements are as efficient as possible. So for walls, for example, you wanna make sure you're maintaining a stress of less than 0.15 F-G. As when we're looking at elements that are more stressed than that, the code requires us to have more reinforcement and confinement in those wall elements. So it will be a more expensive endeavor. And if possible, you want to make sure we're maintaining a concrete grade less than 50 MPA, which will require you to have additional confinement in your structure. Now confinement is really where all the cost will go in your wall design. The efficient design of columns follows a similar rule set to the design of walls. So making sure that you're maintaining as minimum reinforcement wherever possible. So if you can, sizing it up to be a 1% reinforcement rate, yes, you can go up to a 2, 3% column or 4% column if needed to be because you're constrained with size. But sizing the columns such that they can maintain that 1% reinforcement rate wherever possible. And similar to walls, if it can be less than 50 MPA, there's also benefits here through the reduced confinement requirements. When you think about column sizes, you can either have rectangular, square, or circular columns. And so when we're thinking about those league arrangements, we can see that the circular column only has a single layer of spiral around the outside, where the square and rectangulars need to have leagues through the center. So there's quite a lot of additional leagues in the square and rectangular columns. So there's about a 10 to 20% saving if you can adopt a circular column wherever possible. After locating the vertical supports in your structure, the next thing to consider is the location of your permanent or temporary movement joints. So when locating these temporary and permanent movement joints, there's a couple of things you need to consider. First, you need to look at where your strength is going to be and making sure that you're not locking up those movement joints. So when it shrinks, it's locking up between, or trying to put it between two cores. So when it does shrink, they can pull away from each other. Other things that you need to consider is the temporary and permanent stability of the structure. So are you able to keep the structure stable in both its temporary and permanent states? And and also considering what are the maximum pore sizes that you can have based on your site constraints. So how much concrete can they pour in one day based on the access and concrete that you have available to you. Another thing to also consider is to make sure your pores aren't too big overall. So you want to make sure that you're maintaining permanent and temporary movement joints roughly every 50 to 70 meters so that you don't have too much shrinkage stress or thermal expansion. 
Something else that you need to consider when laying out your concrete structure is what spans should you be achieving in your slabs and beams to make sure they're not either too short or too long. Limiting your spans to about a minimum length of about five meters as any shorter, you will not be able to have that as post tensioning. So it will need to have a less efficient RC design and also structures are typically going to be governed by minimum depths at this point as you need a minimum depth for fire rating. So typically you want to try and maintain your span somewhere between 6 to 10 meters for the most efficient design as this has the greatest benefits between deflections and flexural design and you have additional efficiencies with that continuity as well. However, anything over about 10 meters is rarely where efficiencies start to drop off and this is because structures typically beyond this limit are governed by deflections or vibrations. So you'll need to increase the size of the structure, making it less efficient to make sure you're controlling deflections or vibrations in the structure. Something to have in the back of your mind is the maximum length of a reinforcement bar for an efficient design. So reinforcement bars come in around 12 meter lengths. So when you're laying out your reinforcement to achieve a most efficient solution for the material that you have, it's having some multiple of that 12 meter length you also need to consider where you need to have your top reinforcement lapping and where you need your bottom reinforcement lapping. So typically your top reinforcement needs to go beyond those inflection points and typically bottom reinforcement. You want to lap it near a support as this is where you'll typically have the least tensile forces in the bottom of your structure. Locating penetrations early on can achieve efficiencies in your concrete slab designs. So this is where I've come up with a traffic light system that helps both me and the architect locate penetrations in the most efficient location possible. So we have red, orange, and green. Where obviously red is near the supports, and this is areas that where you wanna try and avoid, as if you have penetrations in these locations, it potentially affects the punching shear zone. So you may need additional punching shear reinforcement, or you may need to put additional support structures around it so you can get to the column. So it's really inefficient to have penetrations in these locations. And then you have orange, which is your column strip. So it's still a support line. So you're trying to maintain minimum penetrations in these locations as they may adversely affect the support structure if you have too big a penetration. However, it's not as bad as the red location. And then you have green, which is in your middle middle strip. So you can have as big a penetration as you need in these locations and have a minimal adverse effect on your structural design. So by maintaining this traffic light system and providing it to the architect, they can try and locate penetrations in the most efficient location possible, especially early on. An easy way to achieve efficiency in your beams or slabs is to add post tensioning as this overcomes some of the major deficiencies of concrete structures, which is primarily its tensile capacity. By adding these additional pre-compression forces, it allows the concrete structure to have greater loads in it before the concrete cracks. And also by having a drape, it allows you to pull loads from the most critical locations such as mid spans and pull them more towards supports where they're less critical. So when looking at a post-tension design, what type of PNAs, which is the pre-compression force, should you have in your structure? Well, typically you should try to maintain a minimum of roughly one MPA pre-compression force for a minimum of crack control with really the bare minimum being 0.7 MPA. Now this is the minimum crack control you need where you don't really care about finishes and you may still have some minor cracking in certain locations. The typical p that you shouldn't be aiming for in most designs is roughly about a 1.4 MPA as this provides a moderate degree of crack control and has that balance between that crack control and the post tensioning that you have in the structure. Or sometimes you need a strong degree of crack control, which will be somewhere between 2.5 to 3 MPA. And this will be typically for your roof structures, podium structures, or watertight structures. We need to control the cracking to ensure the water tightness of the structure or to maintain the structure during thermal contraction and expansion. When laying out tendons, you need to make sure that the tendons are not either too long or too short, as if they're too short, they're not able to be effective to pre-compress the slabs, or if they're too long, they may have too much friction forces to have an efficient PNA in your structure. So tendons that are too short are typically less than about six meters. As anything less than this, you're not able to pre-compress the slab enough Typical spans, you want to try and keep them between 12 to 25 meters. So these can be a continuous tendon across multiple spans. And this is where you'll have the most efficiencies from that continuity and the post tensioning. When you're starting to exceed 25 meters and approaching 35 meters, you have a significant reduction in the post tensioning that you have in your structure through the loss in friction forces. And you will need to start considering between flipping lives and dead ends between different sides of your structure 
to ensure that you have an average PNA across your slab. So anything more but then about 35 to 40 meters, you've really lost the benefit of post tensioning and should really be considering whether you should have a revised layout of tendons. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I've got links to my Patreon in the below description. Without the support of my Patreons, these type of episodes would not be possible. And I'd just like to give a quick shout out to one of my newest Patreons, Alan Rezai. Thank you for joining the team. And as always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.